Our next speaker is <clears throat> Jeremy Davis from the National Cancer Institute. Dr. Davis is the Surgeon in Chief of the NIH Clinical Center. He did his residency at Indiana University, a surgical oncology fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and his research interests involve hereditary stomach cancers, uh, specifically those caused by mutations in CDH1 and molecular underpinnings of gastric cancer development and metastasis. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks again for having me, uh, Rob and, and Juha. Um, so, so that was a great start by Dr. Stoffel. So I don't. I, I'm not going to uh, try to, to maybe add to anything she said, uh, but we may touch on a few more things uh, uh, that, that naturally progress from that. So I have no disclosures. Um, just a, a brief outline. I want to tell you a little bit about what we do at the NIH, because I think uh, for a lot of people, um, they're surprised to know that, that uh, I'm a surgeon and I actually operate at the NIH. There's a hospital. Um, why endoscopic surveillance for early gastric cancer is important. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our results with current methods of endoscopic surveillance, and then the results of a phase two study that we recently completed, and then some future uh, directions. So just uh, to give you an idea of what uh, I do uh, is I'm interested in gastric cancer uh, uh, from an initiation and a metastasis standpoint. As a surgeon, obviously, I see people with uh, uh, CDH1 mutations, but I also see people with advanced gastric cancer. So as part of our research program, uh, we have intervention trials for advanced gastric cancer or peritoneal carcinomatosis. We have a great uh, uh, laboratory effort with my partner, Dr. Hernandez, uh, doing ex vivo modeling of human tissue. And I'm going to focus uh, uh, today, though, mainly on our hereditary gastric cancer study and how that fits into our, our research. So. Um, our research program, uh, really our aim is to study the spectrum uh, of the disease of gastric adenocarcinoma. So uh, like I mentioned, we have uh, protocols not just for early stage gastric cancer or, or hereditary gastric cancer, but also patients with peritoneal carcinomatosis. And, and obviously we study both hereditary and sporadic forms of gastric cancer. I, I focus mainly on diffuse type gastric cancer, which we haven't really talked uh, much about here uh, because most of what we see uh, and have talked about with relation to H. pylori is intestinal type gastric cancer. But, but I think diffuse type gastric cancer is important to talk about because it's really recalcitrant to current therapies. Not to say that intestinal type is, is more sensitive, but, but diffuse type is known to be pretty aggressive. And it clearly has a predilection for very, very early metastasis. We can find evidence of microscopic peritoneal metastases uh, even in patients with uh, relatively early T stage and N stage tumors. And again, we want to understand the mechanisms of carcinogenesis to help inform novel chemo prevention and treatment strategies. So you already heard a little bit about hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, so I won't go too much into this. Just know that, uh, for instance, in these uh, patients in Alaska that had uh, genetic testing, clearly they were looking for CDH1, but uh, we know now that we should also be looking for CTNNA1 or alpha-catenin because that's been described in some families in Europe. We also, uh, Dr. Stoffel uh, touched on the lifetime risk estimates of diffuse type gastric cancer. And these estimates now are a little bit more uh, wide ranging because of the two studies that, that uh, were published last summer. Um, and again, I'm not talking about the risk of breast cancer, but as somebody who takes care of patients with CDH1 mutations, this uh, risk of breast cancer is quite high. Uh, and the other reason uh, these, uh, 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 of our, our hereditary gastric cancer conversations are going to center around what we want to prevent, right, which is peritoneal carcinomatosis, which unfortunately is a common outcome in, in any patient with gastric cancer, specifically diffuse type gastric cancer, because these patients suffer malignant bowel obstructions, uh, uh, nausea, vomiting, and, and a lot of uh, symptoms that are really hard to bear. So again, the uh, Management guidelines for patients with hereditary diffuse gastric cancer uh, are to uh, consider gastrectomy starting at the age of 20, um, uh, especially in families with a uh, confirmed history of diffuse gastric cancer. And then for those patients who uh, decline gastrectomy or want to delay gastrectomy, annual endoscopic surveillance. And Dr. Stoffel alluded to the Cambridge protocol or the Cambridge method of non-targeted or, or random gastric biopsies.
So just uh, briefly, our study is relatively young. We opened it in 2017, and we've been very fortunate to enroll over 325 patients to date and over 90 families. Probably 90% of these are uh, confirmed CDH1 uh, uh, pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants. Um, a few meet clinical criteria but have had uh, negative genetic testing. And uh, so far, we've done about 76 total gastrectomies. The median age is quite uh, broad. If you see that age 71 and you wonder what in the heck I'm doing, that 71-year-old, that, that was a, a, a long discussion about kind of the risks and benefits of, of prophylactic gastrectomy. But like Dr. Stoffel mentioned, 94% uh, of the time, our uh, pathologists who also work very, very hard to find these needles in a haystack are able to find uh, T1A signet ring cell carcinomas. Uh, once in a while, we'll find uh, carcinoma in situ. But, but clearly, the genetic uh, defect is highly penetrant if we're finding signet ring cells in almost every patient that has a prophylactic gastrectomy. And by the way, some of these patients also have not had any known family history of gastric cancer. Mainly, they came to, to light because of the CDH1 uh, mutation on a panel test for a history of breast cancer. So this is what I spend uh, my Mondays doing now. Um, so a uh, total gastrectomy specimen. And inevitably, what we, what we find are these uh, foci of signet ring cells. So just so you know, these are in the lamina propria. Um, so that, that defines them as T1A. And oftentimes, they're quite small, measuring anywhere from 200 microns in diameter, the largest probably up to a millimeter or two millimeters in diameter. But they're, but they're very, very small, so you can understand why you wouldn't see them with regular white light endoscopy. So what we believe uh, uh, kind of the pathway is um, for the development of hereditary diffuse gastric cancer is that somebody is born with a germline CDH1 mutation, so they have uh, one good copy of the gene and, and one bad. And so on the, on the far left, you see an otherwise normal looking gastric pit or gland. But at some point, and, and, it, and it's probably a random event, uh, something uh, causes loss of heterozygosity, and, and people have uh, talked about promoter hypermethylation as a cause, uh, but basically e cadherin expression is lost, and this leads uh, most likely to the formation of these signet ring cells that invade the basement membrane and set up shop in the lamina propria. But something else has to happen for these cells to eventually grow uh, invade and, and spread. So, so why endoscopic surveillance, at least in this population, matters? Well, uh, total gastrectomy is a major life-altering operation, and, and unfortunately, uh, some of my patients uh, struggle, although many of them do quite well. Um, but I think a sensitive surveillance technique could allow for the avoidance of total gastrectomy in some patients because there are many patients out there that really don't want to have the gastrectomy. They think they'd like to consider surveillance, but they know that surveillance techniques right now are not very sensitive. The false negative biopsy rate right now is currently too high, and, and I'll show some data. And I think the other reason why a really good endoscopic surveillance technique matters, and this is really now coming from the person who wants to understand the, the biology here, is that a lot of us in the community talk about chemo prevention studies uh, for patients with hereditary diffuse gastric cancer syndrome. And I think that the only way we're going to be able to even run clinical trials for chemo prevention will depend on reliable and reproducible detection of these occult cancer foci. So the Cambridge method, again, you've heard this. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll just go over it briefly. Again, targeted biopsy of any abnormal lesion. If you talk to the folks in Cambridge, they'll tell you that they believe these pale areas are really, really important. The problem is their own data suggests that the specificity is quite low for pale areas. So you look at a pale area, you biopsy it, only about 10% of the time will you find signet ring cells. Um, the 30 biopsies that they take, 24 they use for diagnosis, actually the remaining six they use for research. And they detect, uh, uh, or they report a detection rate of about 60%, but as I'm going to come to show in a few minutes, that, that at least in our experience, 30 random biopsies, uh, our detection rate is pretty low. Now you could argue that maybe we're doing something wrong, but, but that's our experience. 
So what are the challenges? Again, I mentioned these signet ring cell foci are, are multifocal. They, they make up what's estimated to be less than 2% of the gastric surface area. They're very small, uh, like I told you. And people have used things like narrowband imaging, chromoendoscopy. I'm not a gastroenterologist, so you know more than I do about this. But this does not uh, seem to improve detection rates. So a couple years ago, one of our former gastroenterology fellows uh, uh, Brian Curtin, who's now working in Baltimore, um, established a, uh, um, a schema for doing biopsies in patients. Uh, we had done a series of patients using the Cambridge method, or using the Cambridge method, and then Brian uh, uh, adapted uh, something that was talked about earlier today, um, a, a systematic method of, of uh, uh, imaging the, the stomach. Um, and, and use that to guide biopsies, and we looked at our experience in about 110 patients. He presented this at DDW. So these 22 zones were adapted from uh, a paper that was shown earlier today, um, and this is a, a diagram showing those 22 zones. So we go in and, and we image each of those zones. Uh, obviously, anything abnormal is biopsied. But what we do is we take biopsies from each of those 22 areas. So that ends up being 88 biopsies. So you heard about the paper about, well, if we take 1,000 or however many biopsies, maybe we'll, we'll increase our level of detection. But we thought 88 was reasonable. And it didn't take that long, I promise. Um, but just in this, in this uh, uh, brief uh, uh, description of the results, using the Cambridge method in our hands, um, uh, the detection rate of signet ring cells was about 14%. And obviously when we increased that to 88 biopsies, obviously our detection rate went up. And you can imagine if we went up to 1,000 biopsies, maybe that detection rate would be 90%, but that obviously is impractical. So we know that 88 biopsies is impractical. So we embarked on an advanced uh, uh, endoscopic imaging technique. So Dr. Curtin paired up with one of our surgical oncology research fellows, Dr. Samantha Ruff, and wrote this phase two clinical trial evaluating probe-based confocal laser endomicroscopy for the detection of early stage gastric cancer in, in patients with hereditary diffuse gastric cancer syndrome. So our primary objective was to determine if confocal endoscopy afforded a greater sensitivity for detection of signet ring cell foci. And our secondary objective was to define the false negative rate of signet ring cell foci detection in patients who subsequently underwent total gastrectomy. Uh, we enrolled 37 patients. One of them had, uh, later we determined was a, uh, had a variant of uncertain significance. So we evaluated the 36 patients that had pathogenic or likely pathogenic CDH1 variants. Uh, if you're unaware of the confocal laser endomicroscopy system, this is uh, kind of what it uh, looks like. The cell visio system uh, consists of that uh, tower. There's a probe, a fiber optic probe that uh, goes through the uh, working uh, channel of a standard endoscope. Uh, we administer IV fluorescein as a contrast agent just prior to the evaluation. Your field of view is quite small. It's only 250 microns. Resolution is pretty good, though, and the confocal depth is about 55 to 65 micrometers. I do want to mention this real quick because we've talked a lot today about intestinal metaplasia. And again, um, uh, I won't uh, go into too much detail because I'm not an expert in this. but. But with the confocal probe, if you're looking at intestinal metaplasia, you're looking at the, the surface epithelium. I think our challenge with using confocal endomicroscopy uh, for hereditary diffuse gastric cancers, we're looking a little bit deeper, right? These signet ring cells typically lie in the lamina propria. So uh, our methods. We did our complete endoscopic evaluation, uh, starting off with photographs of these uh, 22 zones. We biopsied any focal abnormalities during the procedure. Uh, we placed the confocal probe in each of these 22 areas. How long we spent in each area uh, varied. When we were all done with the confocal evaluation, because we ultimately uh, uh, felt that we needed some comparator. We elected to uh, perform the Cambridge protocol in a non-targeted fashion. Here are the characteristics of our patients. You can uh, see the median age. Most of them are female, and most are Caucasian. 
the median number of uh, confocal uh, directed biopsies was seven, and we based our biopsies on what we believed looked abnormal uh, based on, on prior experience. Uh, you can see that most of our biopsies uh, um, uh, were taken from the fundus of the stomach. Uh, rarely were we taking uh, biopsies from the uh, distal stomach. So in these 36 patients undergoing 36 uh, separate procedures, um, there were six uh, biopsies that were positive, or excuse me, sorry, six patients that had positive findings uh, for signet ring cell carcinoma using the uh, confocal probe. Uh, interestingly, three of these positive cases uh, were in the setting of negative biopsies um, uh, uh, using the Cambridge uh, non-targeted uh, technique. And in four cases, uh, the f we had uh, signet ring cell uh, findings on biopsy when we used the non-targeted uh, Cambridge uh, biopsy technique. And in one of those cases, uh, this was in the setting of uh, negative uh, confocal uh, biopsies. Fifteen of those 36 patients uh, subsequently underwent total gastrectomy, and all 15 were positive for signet ring cell carcinoma on final pathology. I just want to give you an example real quick. This actually was the first patient. Uh, on the left is a picture from the posterior fundus. Uh, 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 what uh, I believe this shows in the blue line are uh, normal gastric pits or glands with intervening tissue. And on the right is a picture from the anterior fundus, and we thought this looked abnormal with uh, some separation of the gastric pits. And if you look at the um, corresponding uh, images or photomicrographs from those biopsies, you can see that the posterior fundus uh, biopsy was negative for signet ring cells, whereas the anterior fundus biopsy was positive for signet ring cells. Again, this picture is from a, a separate patient, but it shows what we believe to be one of the defining features of these uh, abnormal confocal images, which is uh, distracted or, 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 or uh, gastric pits that are pushed apart with this intervening haziness uh, in, the, uh, in the stroma that uh, suggests the presence of signet ring cells. So the false negative rate or biopsy rate, which I think is the most important outcome of this uh, study, uh, shows that with the Cambridge method, our uh, false negative biopsy rate was very, very high. And again, this goes to why we believe that surveillance endoscopy in these patients is, is fraught with uh, difficulty. But the application of uh, confocal endoscopy improved the false negative rate, but not not significantly, and again, this is a, a small uh, study with only 36 patients. So, so what did we learn? Well, we learned that there's a learning curve with the use of probe-based confocal and uh, laser endomicroscopy, and that just has to do uh, with uh, how you place the probe on the gastric mucosa. We actually used a 2T uh, endoscope so that we could have the probe in one channel and the biopsy forceps in the other channel so that as we had the probe on the mucosa and identified something, we could easily put in the uh, biopsy probe and biopsy without uh, having to pull something out and put something back in. Uh, the learning curve must include proper, proper image interpretation, and I'm going to tell you uh, what we did kind of in a post hoc analysis in a minute. And then obviously it takes time. I didn't give you the data uh, yet uh, uh, today, but uh, the time, uh, median time for the procedure is about 50 minutes. So next steps. We uh, want to apply machine learning to improve our use of uh, confocal endomicroscopy. And we plan on incorporating uh, confocal endomicroscopy into our ongoing studies uh, of CDH1 mutation carriers. So I just want to give you an example. These uh, are our partners in the molecular imaging program at the National Cancer Institute led by Dr. Turkby. And uh, basically, they, they set up uh, three uh, projects. One was cancer detection uh, using uh, confocal endomicroscopy. The second one was cancer detection uh, on, on pathology or H&E images. Uh, and then uh, project three, which I'll just mention briefly, is this image-to-image -image translation, which I think is the most promising. But basically, the image-to-image -image translation hypothesis is that uh, the uh, confocal uh, uh, images 
have features of gastric cancer, uh, or the features of gastric cancer contain information about the morphological features on H&E images. So using the probe-based uh, confocal images, we can produce simulated H&E of high enough quality for cancer detection. So uh, it's an iterative process, and I am by no means an expert in um, artificial intelligence or, or machine learning, uh, but these are the things that uh, we're working on uh, currently to uh, enhance our use of this technology. So in summary, this is weird how it went. Wow, that's great. Detection of early gastric cancer, I think, is, is quite necessary, not only for patient care, but, but again, as, 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 a, as a researcher, uh, I think it's going to help us understand gastric uh, pathogenesis. Endoscopic methods of cancer surveillance, uh, at least in this cohort, are going to remain our primary tool. I don't see that changing anytime soon. But machine learning applied to our use of probe-based confocal into microscopy may improve early cancer detection, at least for hereditary uh, diffuse gastric cancer patients. And with that, I'll say thank you. This is a picture of the NIH Clinical Center, which uh, is uh, where I work. And if any of you are ever in Washington, D.C., I'd be happy to show you around. Thank you.